Thank you very much. Um, I normally find myself addressing um, uh, parish councils and students. So uh, ordinarily, my talk is a bit of a manifesto for what we do. But today, I feel as though I'm among like-minded souls, and indeed, some of my heroes are here. So uh, given that I've got, I think, two and a half minutes now to, to <laughs> speak, to catch up, um, I'm not going to take too long. And I want to talk a little bit. I want to share with you some of our learning. Um, our business we started, as you very kindly said, and this is, this is our scheme in Swindon that we built of 42 homes, mixed homes, blind tenure, built in the teeth of the recession uh, on an old caravan site in Brownfield derelict land in the middle of the city. Swindon, as you know, is car city. And when we told them we wanted to put a car club, they laughed. As Bob Monkhouse said, when I told them I wanted to be a comedian, they laughed. They're not laughing now. <laughs> Think about that. Um, we'll come back to our, our car club success in Swindon shortly. Um, we started in 2007. Really, we call it the Hab Philosophical Society to begin with because we didn't quite know what we wanted to do. We, we wanted to see change in Britain's housing. We wanted to see change in the way that housing wasn't simply delivered, but in the way that we made places and delivered communities and, and brought um, a social dimension to new development and regeneration uh, in the UK, which has been missing in this country uh, probably for 50 or 60 years in the mainstream. And our uh, intention is still to see that change globally uh, across the housing market in the UK. We've got a lot of work to do yet. Um, we were driven principally by anger um, and by frustration and uh, we very, it very quickly emerged that what we wanted to do was to work alongside communities and develop a collaborative approach to planning and delivery of schemes and to make places which were highly socially sustainable as well as building eco-homes, whatever they are. And uh, those objectives remain absolutely dear to us and through the design process and through the architectural process we um, believe we, we build places which are highly distinctive that uh, uh, really does do have a lot of, of local identity and are rich in, in local narrative. Um, this is just a detailed shot from our second scheme in Stroud built on an old hospital site. You can see the corner of an existing building there. Uh, Stroud is a, a town not far from here in the region. We're not building in Bristol yet. We keep trying, by the way. We even had to move our business here in the hope to try and persuade Bristol City Council that they might give us some work. Um, and we're still knocking on doors and still trying to collaborate with communities uh, in Bristol. I have to say, it's not the easiest place to work as a developer. Anybody working in Bristol will tell you this. Um, there are, on the other hand, I will say, 800 community schemes which, if you like, forming the bedrock of Bristol Green Capital 2015, and they are absolutely exemplary. It's, uh, I have to say, I have to lay down a marker here and say I'm actually disappointed that in 2015 we have not been able to deliver or even begin a kind of a groundbreaking green, deep green uh, housing scheme in Bristol. And uh, all I can say is that uh, if we follow the example of European cities of culture, well, then, of course, this is a springboard. And so ever optimistic, I look forward to starting something very exciting wow. soon. Um, <laughs> we've worked in Swindon, we've worked in Stroud. Um, public realm design, the spaces in between buildings are very important for us. Um, and I don't mean here the, the public realm of, of city centres, and I know we're talking about cities as a whole, but our schemes are, are neighbourhoods. So our public realm is, is the, the small little gritty stuff in between the buildings, in between the houses. We provide gardens for people, we provide private gardens, we also provide large social spaces as well. So um, you can see here on the plan, on the right hand side there's, a, there's an arrangement of, of houses around a public square. There's no car access into that public square, it's, it's effectively a, rather like a, a London square, it's a, it's a, it's a semi-private garden for residents who live around that. And on the scheme, through the houses, we have incidental areas, we have a, a wildlife corridor, we have car parks which are also bull playing areas, car parks which are also uh, orchards, we also have dedicated orchards, 
We have allotments down on the bottom left of the site of the, of the U, and we have many allotments and incidental food growing, as I said, throughout the scheme. And for us, the, the connection between people and place can be something which can be woven narratively, it can be woven through design, it can be more intensely than anything else woven through activity and a sense of ownership and even physical ownership of that public realm through bodies such as community land trusts and, and similar agencies. And the importance of food is absolutely crucial. Uh, just as the immediate environment of our homes is, is, is the environment in which we should <laughs> perhaps be making the, the strongest connections with our environment um, through water use, uh, through uh, play, through um, uh, an opportunity to share the amenity and uh, reduce car use. So also food and food growing and food production, no matter how light, no matter how simple and, and, and no matter how much it's part of the background, <laughs> is fundamental. So instead of a pyracanthus, we'll always plant a gooseberry. Instead of a, a hedge between houses, we'll always plant a, uh, an espalier apple tree that will uh, allow neighbours to then have an argument as to who owns the apples, who's going to make the apple pie, who's going to eat the apple pie. So food is a fantastic, for us, a fantastic way of getting people out there, sharing cups of coffee, standing in the middle of the street and letting their kids out and, and playing in the rain. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great... Um, it's a great unlocker of public realm. And although you can't see it here, we have, a, we actually, we have a, an allotment building next to the allotment site here, which is for the benefit of existing allotment holders in the town. But it's an own building on one side. It has inside it and just outside a barbecue area. So it also can be used by new and existing residents for entertaining, for parties, for kids' play in the rain, for all kinds of incidental uh, and ambiguous little activities that we haven't thought of yet. Uh, so moving on, we're doing other schemes in the area, as Suzanne kindly mentioned. Uh, this one is in um, just outside Winchester. It's actually a village extension, uh, although Winchester is growing so fast you could almost see this effectively as an, as an urban extension to, to the town. Now what's really interesting about the scheme, the reason I mention this, it's in planning at the moment. Last night, the village parish authority met to look at this scheme and uh, unanimously voted for it. This is on effectively a piece of land that was outside the planning envelope. Those of you who uh, read any British daily paper will know just how difficult it is to achieve planning permission without opposition in the UK right now, particularly outside the, the, the urban environment. And this scheme was one which was brought forward with landowners, residents, the parish council on land outside the planning envelope with the collaboration of the local authority who then altered the draft local plan to include this land in that plan and it's a demonstration therefore of localism should we say and the flexibility of the national planning policy framework in adapting it's a kind of it's an for me it's an exemplar of, of how we can bring forward schemes collaboratively with residents to suit their needs, to provide for local housing need. Um, I won't pretend that it's common. It's a model that we would like to repeat again and again and see repeated. And there are, as I said, you know, we, we began, by the way, our work and our discussions well before the publication of the National Planning Policy Framework and well before the Government's Localism Act of 2011. So um, we now have those tools with which to work, and it's remarkable that actually so few developers really use them. And do, and do pursue that collaborative approach. We have on this scheme everything from uh, social affordable rented accommodation houses and flats uh, right through to private uh, uh, owned buildings, a variety of ownership models, blind tenure, you can't tell who is who, where they live, whether they own or they rent. Everybody gets access to the sports pitch, to the playing fields, to the allotments, to the shared amenity, the bike club, the car club. Uh, all the kind of stuff which makes life uh, civilised. Uh, and just to say, actually, it's, a, it's an incidental thing. I mean, Jan Gale has done a huge amount of work in Christchurch. I've done a tiny bit, and we, I was involved in the judging of a, a scheme called Breathe, which is, um, takes a similar approach to the regeneration of Christchurch City. And, and if you haven't been to Christchurch, you'll know that the, what the earthquake dig was, was, was kind of really... It was the final 
final toll, really, in, in a series of, um, of planning uh, decisions made to that city uh, over the past um, 60 years, which were relatively dysfunctional. Um, so you have this, you have this city centre, which was in the model of those Southeast Asian cities and, and, and that, 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 uh, the, the cities, cities of the, the Southern Hemisphere on that American model, which is zoned. And right in the middle, you had these 20, 30-story buildings, the ground floor of which was let for retail, the first and second floor of which were let for offices, and every other floor remained empty. And so from the very word go, as, as a model, that, that zoned relatively high approach didn't work in Christchurch. And, and what it's provided now is um, an opportunity to rebuild that city, bringing people right into the middle of it and re-greening it. It was, after all, at its inception, one of the world's first garden cities. And um, even really before that term was fully evolved and can be again. Um, I just wanted to say something very briefly about the design process. Now, we use the design process. We, we have a landscape architect within our business. We have two architects. Um, we work with many other practices as our consultants. We have a respect for the design process, something which has been honed over several thousand years uh, as a means of delivering the very best possible outcomes and resisting compromise. It's something which the Egyptians used. It's something which uh, we should ignore at our peril and, uh, and never... Uh, never resist in, in preference of a, of a more fashionable model or idea because it simply is finely tuned and honed to deliver the best possible outcomes. And I just wanted to mention this because this is a, actually a, a design council model which shows how, how actually as, as a business uh, you can use design in a, a variety number of ways as styling or as a, a process to deliver or even... An, the, the acme of the model is on the right-hand side, where you use the design process actually in your ac accounting control and your modelling and your um, marketing and, uh, and even your management. Every aspect of the business can benefit from it as, as a tool. And as a result, uh, we as a company use a lot of uh, familiar processes which you'd find in design practices, which would be things like uh, design crits, but we also, of course, will crit... Um, We'll create an accounts package as well. Um, and um, uh, feedback loops and lots of workshopping. And uh, this is our model. As you can see, it's uh, slightly, slightly adapted uh, with a Bristol bent. Um, uh, we, we, uh, yeah, we have an account with a local cider manufacturer. And um, it's a very, very useful uh, process and uh, the outcomes of this is uh, are, are schemes which um, we're now marketing uh, to build uh, housing uh, where we uh, engage communities at early stages we find out what the uh, appetite is for self-build and custom build in an area local authorities are meant to do this of course but are yet to rise to this challenge and um, and then we custom build and the reason being is that uh, this is some interesting research now from four years ago, which shows that in the UK, the appetite for custom and self-build, 53% of people want to build a, a home at some stage. In uh, it Wales, it's nearly 70%. I don't know what that reflects. Um, but for us, a very, very important aspect of self-build, community self-build, co-housing schemes and the opportunity to work with developers as enablers to do custom build schemes, all of these things produce better, more affordable, cheaper, better value, greener homes that are better built, but which also create that magic thing, which is the magic social glue. When people come together and work together, it happens, it's generated, and we see it time and time again in schemes. Uh, and in cities and in, in all kinds of social initiatives. It's building together it helps build the community, just as working in allotment does the same thing. Uh, here are some more statistics from the UK, which in the UK, by the way, compared to Austria, where 80% of new homes are self-built or custom-built, in the UK it's 8%. So... Uh, what we have is a dysfunctional market that doesn't, a uh, dysfunctional delivery um, model which doesn't serve the market where 30% of people want to tackle self builder, 12% want to tackle it in the next year, nearly half a million people searching right move for plots. And one in four, 25% of people want to be involved in a group. 
project, a group self-build, and that's something we dearly like to bring forward in Bristol. It's already happening, by the way. The community self-build agency, the charity, is working with uh, ex-service men and women uh, to enable them to community to, to, to build uh, build homes together as as groups, and they've, they've built one scheme and are building another in Bristol. Uh, and to enable this, we try and make the model as simple as possible for our customers. So. We're trying to streamline the process, to, to de-stress it and de-risk it, and we're also offering, I feel like, a sort of number of very easily understandable uh, options and what we call smart spaces, which are sort of bolt-on bits that allow you to customise and, and tailor your home to your needs. And um, the result for us is going to be an involvement in, a, in, a, in what is going to be Britain's largest self-build and custom-build scheme in, in Bista. Um, which is a scheme of 2,000 homes. You may have come across this. It's called Graven Hill, and it's modelled on the uh, Dutch Almira scheme uh, just outside Amsterdam, uh, the big self-build scheme there. And uh, what we're doing is, is aiming to offer uh, all of our customers the choice to, to custom and self-build uh, homes like this. Uh, now, um, I'm just going to return very briefly to this idea of what, a, what a, an eco house is. What is a green home? It could be this, it could be this, it could be this. It can be anything you like. And I think the point we understand is that um, it's very easy to build to code levels. It's very easy, actually, to build a, a, a low-energy home. But then if all people do is move in, turn the heating up to full, and then control the temperature by opening the windows, we failed utterly. And the idea of focusing, which we, we have this culture in this country of focusing on the the tangible, the structured, the, 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 the codified, the boxed, ticked item, um, that takes us away from one of the fundamental underlying principles of making proper socially sustainable communities, and that is you've got to get people to share. You've got to get people to understand what they're doing, why they're, why they're living there, and how they might do their small bit. And our philosophy really is pretty straightforward here. We just put in a lot of stuff and we expect quite a lot of it to fail. So we might put in incidental food growing and we might put in vegetable gardening, we might put in allotments and we might put in, I don't know, an edible hedgerow and uh, a, a car park with apple trees. And we know that within two years the trees in the car park will have died and the edible hedgerow will have been covered in weeds. And the allotments might actually only be occupied by 10% of the, the, the residents. But the, those, those little uh, espaliered apple trees between the houses have been a great success. And you only need one or two little kickstart ideas to get that community to start talking to, to work with each other. And what we find is, is time and again, um, we have to overcompensate when we build schemes because we're all the time elaborating with that community what they might want, what they might like, evolving the design process and the dialogue with them. And, and in the end, not even they or we know fully what will transpire. This is Swindon. We put in a car club. We put in real live time displays in people's houses to show them what, what time the bus was coming to the bus stop just outside the development. We put in bike storage, and on other schemes we're doing electric bike um, uh, storage and, and bike sh electric bike sharing. And we, did, we put this scheme in, and what was very interesting is that we went back after six months, and the car club had been a disaster. We couldn't understand it. Nobody had taken up ownership. Nobody had taken up uh, uh, membership of the car club. And we, we, we puzzled about it, and we, we worried very much that all those predictions about Swindon being car city and nobody would ever, you know, take it up because that's where, you know, everybody drives and there's roundabouts everywhere. And it's got the magic roundabout, you know, the largest roundabout in the world that people come to from Japan to study. And, um, and, and we couldn't understand really what we'd done wrong other than perhaps mistimed it. And then we looked in all the bike sheds, and this is what we saw. And we realized we'd... We'd overcompensated to the extent everybody had gone out and bought three bikes. Every household was, was a, a bicycle household. Nobody needed to join the car club. We went back a year later, and interestingly enough, the car club was beginning to thrive, and it's thriving because residents from the previous existing community who are living in semi-detached houses uh, are now joining, and they're using it. And in fact, Bristol, uh, beg your pardon, Swindon, 
uh, city council have now uh, uh, adopted the model and they're running their own car club citywide as well. So we were probably a little bit previous, just slightly, but in the end, uh, it kind of, the car club found its way and the bicycles were a huge success. And you never know where, which, which is going to work. Um, I just want to talk briefly about water. Um, central resource, and managing it is, is absolutely fundamental and, and um, you know, we're all familiar, I think, with SUD's management schemes and, and trying to, wherever possible, attenuate water on a scheme and not let it go too quickly, run too quickly into the, into the infrastructure. But one of the important things I wanted to say was that it's also a fantastic amenity. And um, I'm going to come to a little explanation in a minute, but, but one of the things we love to see is children putting on a Macintosh, running outside, playing when it's raining because you've been able to express water in a scheme and all of a sudden that little dry patch or that dry uh, little uh, conduit suddenly becomes this little gushing, running, trickling um, space with, with um, wildlife and, and, and children enjoying it. Um, and one thing that's also very important about it in terms of capturing all of this knowledge, all of this social sustainability, this glue, is... Um, is, is actually getting the community, working with them, to uh, somehow consolidate it into some kind of body of work. And the best kind of thing we found is a book. Uh, Rose Seagreve, who's here, uh, helped uh, a project in, we did in Stroud, to, uh, out of which we produced uh, a very large and, and rather wonderful history of the site. It was an old hospital site that we brought forward with um, the Homes and Communities Agency and with um, a Green Square Housing Group. And uh, that's become a, a really powerful ambassador, if you like, for the scheme uh, and something that the residents can feel enormously proud to have contributed to. Uh, we did the same thing here in Swindon with a landscape manual as well. So um, let me just try and explain, uh, as it were, using the tiniest possible example, our approach. Um, as developers, we always complain we don't have much money. Uh, there's no housing grant anymore. And... Um, it's hard to find the cash to put into public realm. The one thing I will say here is that on schemes we've done, we've had an evaluation made by uh, the Horticultural Trades Association and CAVE, who designed this amazing monetizing algorithm. And what they've figured out that in terms of health, educational, social, psychological, um, and ancillary benefits, every one pound spent on public realm yields... Ten pounds in benefit. That's an amazing thing to be able to say to a banker. To monetize the value of public realm like that, and to say that actually across a whole range of social infrastructures, through education and the health service, that the benefits can be felt tenfold is a is a magical thing. So this um, this in this scheme here, in the middle, there's a a tree. It's a willow. It's a sallow. And um, interestingly enough. I bet you, I didn't know this until I looked it up. After oaks, willows support the largest number of invertebrates and the largest number of algae and mosses than any other tree. A willow will support 220 separate invertebrates compared to an elm, which might support 60, compared to a London plain, which supports one, compared to a rhododendron, which supports zero. Holly is very low as well. So the, this tree, this, this humble little tree, which you can grow from a stick, you just plonk it in the ground, is amazingly valuable, this willow. And here it is. We don't plant willows um, next to streams. We plant them in them. We plant them at the bottom of dry swales. And we've learned a great deal from the wonderful landscape architect, Luke Engelbach, who we've collaborated with a lot in this regard. And um, having planted the willow, in the dry swale. Of course, when it rains, what that does, that willow will suck up water, attenuating water in the city infrastructure and creating above it a, uh, a little microclimate as the water evaporates. You get evaporative cooling. It's very refreshing. Um, as a result, that'll help create a little microclimate around that tree and in and around the housing that's in that neighborhood. And, and consequently, the, the housing doesn't require excessive cooling. Um, of course, it'll attract the birds and the bees and the butterflies, common and rare species alike. It'll attract all those invertebrates. That's why. So the biodiversity 
of that one tree uh, makes a massive contribution. It is entirely possible. We, we, we work to one planet living objectives, and one of our big aims is always to increase, if we can massively increase, the biodiversity on a site when we build. Oh, and it'll provide shade, of course. And as a result, in summer, because it's a deciduous tree, uh, some thermal shading, again, reducing the need for energy inputs into the buildings. Uh, and in winter, of course, when the leaves fall off, allowing the sun to track into the building and uh, exploit the thermal mass of that building so that, um, again, we can exploit the, 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 the available resources. Plain amenity, of course, are a fantastically important part of, of this and, and creating a narrative in a place where people can come and talk about the trees and remembering it when they were a child growing up because trees tend to live a lot longer than we do of immense value, narratively. And let's not forget the old wives' tale that if you have a headache, go and sit under a willow, because the willow, until 1940, was the, uh, was the source for salicylic acid, which is aspirin. And it's true that every willow will produce salicylic acid in its bark. You can chew it if you like. Or you can sit under the tree, because the tree will also produce a mantle, if you like, a cloud, through its spores, uh, through its uh, pores of, uh, of that salicylic acid, and it'll have a beneficial effect to surrounding wildlife, fish, and to you. It's, uh, it's antifungal and it's antibacterial. Oh, and let's not forget, too, that we can coppice the willow. We can use it as fuel. It has a biomass value. So even at the end of its life, or halfway through, if you want to coppice it, uh, it'll regrow. Uh, it has an enormously... Uh, uh, sustainable, sustainable value as a, as a timber source. And that willow, I have to remind you, costs us £10. And costs to plant about another £10, which I would argue, in the great scheme of things, is really very, very good value indeed. Oh, and I should remember one more thing. That is, the willow has another magical property, doesn't it? It's the embodiment. It is the carrier. It, it has within it that magic uh, social glue. Thank you very much.